Hi, good evening, and it's Christine Joan Hart. It's the Christine Joan Hart Show, and I'm broadcasting live from London this evening. It's seven o'clock here. I don't know where you are and what time it is. If you're listening live and you're across the water, I'm guessing it's probably during the day. Um, it's It's been really hot here all day, and... Um, it's quite cloudy at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I've got a show tonight, which is going to be a bit of a catch up on my shows, talking about the shows I've got um, coming up and just briefly going over what's going on in my world at the moment. And um, so that's what's going to be um rattling on this evening. I haven't got any guests at the moment, so it's going to be a catch up and an update so if you want to tune in fine if you don't you want to go off and um chill out then that's fine too um so i'm my guests line up the only two guests that i've got coming on um soon that i'm very excited about there's a few um no god that sounds horrible isn't it? there's a few guests that none of you guys will know there's two guests there's two guests that i'm excited about coming on i just mean i'm really pleased about the other guests but i've got two um what i would call um as the celebrity guests coming on i've got joseph farrell who wrote um god's giants and is it god's giants and angels um Gosh, I haven't got the book in front of me. Most of you have heard of Joseph Farrell. He has studied the Nazis and the Nazi Bell for a long, long time. And he's also done stuff on the Anna Nuke and the Nephilim. And he studied that for a long, long time. So um, I want him to come on to pick his brain and to find out what's happening um, in that unseen unseen realm. So um He's he's pretty good with that kind of thing, and I'm I've got one of his books, and um, I'm looking through I'm looking through his books. So he is coming on in May, and I'm really excited about that. I saw him. Um, Kerry Cassidy did an interview with him, uh, but I kind of I wanted to get to the spiritual stuff. As most of you know, I'm really really interested in. Um, the invisible world, the unseen, um, fallen angels, and I, <clears throat> I spent most of my life hunting, hunting down fallen angels. Um, so, yeah. So I will probably do a different angle than um, Kerry. I will focus less on the Nazi bell and the technical stuff that the Nazis are up to and more on his research on the Anainuke Nephilim and what he's found, what he, what the Nazis were up to occult wise. This is my thing. And um, so that's what I'll be grilling him about. Um, the other chat I've got on that I'm really excited about is um, Eric Keating. I don't know how to say his name. Actually, it might be might be a different way it's a kind of odd name i think it's um it's a it's a stage name for him um eric a keating and i found him by accident when i was looking into odin i was astral journeying one night which i don't do deliberately i just find myself doing it um well okay lately i've been doing it deliberately um but i one night i found myself going higher and higher and I went outside it might have been outside the iconic net I don't know but it certainly felt that it was um outside the usual usual spheres and I came face to face with a giant and I was really really small and this is a really big giant in front of me and he see I thought well what is this I'm looking at and he seemed to me I thought it felt like a god, and I thought, well, a god should be like loving and kind, and his face was screwed up with like anger. And then I turned, and he was fighting, fighting a um, serpent. It wasn't like a, it was like a one of these Chinese dragons type things. It was like it had a head, and it had a long, long body that had like dragon scales on it. And this creature was was coming at this giant and the giant was fighting with a sword and I felt masses of love for this uh, 
this this giant creature just so much love it just filled me up and it was the kind of love that I've not really experienced here for apart from my son um that that kind of love I think it was the kind of love that you would die for it it just filled my mind my body and I just felt utterly taken by this being felt so much love and it communicated to me telepathically that it was Odin and I didn't know who the hell Odin was I don't think really even think I'd heard of Odin maybe I had um and then I turned around and I tried to fight the um this long dragon-like creature myself which was kind of pretty silly because I was really small and it had its it had its tail um it, it had its um tail wrapped around the um wrapped around the earth and I looked down I could see the blue earth and its tail was wrapped around this the blue earth really really tightly and um all its black bits were shooting off around the world making the world kind of covered in in its like black bits that were coming off its body and um then I I came back into my body and of course I was bang on excited about oh googling Odin and finding out who who that was because I was pretty damn sure that was a real being and um I googled and I didn't really find what I was looking for and I found people call Odin's children on Facebook and they weren't really what I was looking for. I had some of those guys on the show and they were they're bright guys but it wasn't really I was kind of felt I was looking for something and I didn't really um I didn't really find it and I thought oh maybe that's like nonsense and then I had a very lucid dream where I um felt his presence again Odin's presence and I pressed myself up against him and I said father father where have you been where have you been and he communicated back to me that he'd been there all the time it was me who hadn't been seeing him and I cried and cried, and I kind of, um, my body was crying, my, you know, when I came into my, back into my body, I was crying, I was really crying at the leftover emotion, so I, I wanted to find someone who was emotional about Odin, and I didn't find it in Odin's children, I did more and more research in London, I think that there's a base here, something to do with Odin, I still didn't find it, and I watched some YouTube videos, and I still didn't find it, and I thought, isn't there anyone here that has had the same experience or feels that same passion or, and people kind of had, but they weren't, I wasn't able to kind of click in with their experience very much. And then I found um, the Keating chap on, um, I'd Googled again and, and this um, Eric Keating chap um, was talking about Odin and the runes. And all of a sudden, actually, I did it when I was really, really sleepy and I was just about to fall asleep. And I kind of woke up, you know, when you're listening to something, you think, oh, and you go drifting off and then you hear a few things. So you think, oh, and I woke up again. And this um, Eric chap was really um, talking about it in a spiritual way. And I thought, oh, thank God, at last somebody, somebody gets it. Somebody, you know, gets, gets this thing. And he was talking about it in a different way and now I've kind of actually forgotten um forgotten what he said and I need to um before he comes on the show I need to <clears throat> look at that again or I'm gonna sound foolish I doubt if I'll recount that story um but he seemed to have some kind of um some kind of feeling for it, some kind of feeling for, for that world and that other side. <clears throat> and so I looked at a few more of his videos and then I found out that he seemed to be into um, black magic, which I thought, oh, shit, <laughs> you know, I better, you know, I don't want to um, look at that kind of thing. Um, but then I did. I thought, well, I'll kind of check that out. And... And then I thought, well, that's not for me, that kind of thing. But that guy seems to know about the um, Odin. So I sent an email off to um, his Facebook or whatever, somewhere, 
somewhere that I found on his website, but I didn't get any reply. And um, then I, what happened then? Oh, yes. Then I Googled him a, a little bit more to try and find more Odin, but there wasn't more Odin. But I found him talking to some guy um, with a bald head. You can see it on um, YouTube yourself if you, um, what is it called? It's called um, Who is Azazel? So um, that's A Z A. Z-E-L, who is a Zazel. And um, I clicked on that one night when I was just about to go to sleep and I was listening and I was just kind of drifting off, laying on my back, like my shine. I was just drifting. And um, those two guys, they were kind of just chatting, really. It wasn't like an interview. And um, the Eric chap started saying about um, he had astral traveled one night. I think, I don't know if he'd done some kind of ritual because I, he seems to be into doing rituals. Um, and he something had happened and he journeyed and this spirit had um, appeared. I missed the kind of, because I was kind of asleep. I missed some of it, which I have to go back and listen again. And um, he then had followed this entity back and he said he followed it into the abyss and there it was in the abyss and it was cold. And I was listening to this and as he was describing it, I could see it kind of came into my head and I could really see it strong. And he was crouching in the abyss and he said something about um, he was sitting on a throne covered in serpents and staring into the distance and he didn't really notice that he was there. He didn't acknowledge him, but he knew he was there. And I suddenly had a, a moment, an epiphany moment of that. He was talking, he was talking, this is true. The other guy didn't seem that interested somehow. But um, had I have been there, I'd be like, whoa, hang on now. And he's done some other um, things on this. I still haven't had time to um, look at it. But um, this creature was real and I could kind of feel it. And... Um, then I realized that that had been something that I had searched for all of my life. And I don't know if it was kind of annoying to sort of find someone on YouTube who kind of got there before me. Um, it was in a kind of a way, but it made me see that I had quite wasted, um, wasted my life because literally from age 13, I had, um, I had a hunger for, I had a hunger to find um, a creature like that. I had just, I don't even know how I knew they existed, but I had a hunger, an obsession to find that. And I looked and looked everywhere. I eventually came across um, the Brady thing, which I shared in um, last, I think, Thursday's show. Or was it Monday's show? I think it was Thursday's show. I did the um, monologue about the alien love bites and its effect on me. And I sort of went to these two serial killers. I got to know them, Ian Brady, the Moore's murder, and Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler. In America, I traveled to Washington to meet him. And <clears throat> I was looking for that creature that this chap, Eric, had just, well, bang, he'd gone in and he'd um, he'd met him. Okay, the same guy had been um, uh, digging <clears throat> into the occult for many, many years. Um, so he hadn't just done it off the cuff. So, you know, fair play, somebody had been looking in a different direction. I'd been looking in a certain direction. But um, it, it really interested me that he, he, had, he had got there. So <clears throat> I'd finally contacted him and got him to, um, he didn't say much to me, but he has agreed to come on the show. So that is in mid-May. So that will be fairly interesting, um, even though... There's a part of me that thinks, well, hang on, that's someone's, <laughs> that's what someone's found. And all I feel like saying is hand that over and actually I want that. But then I don't know, do you trust, do you trust what somebody says about something that some something that they've actually located? I mean, it's like, I don't think he's going to mind out the way and let me have his stash kind of thing that's how I feel and then I kind of feel am I conning this person letting them come on and really I don't want to interview well I do want to interview but really I just want his stash that's how I feel and I'm wondering how do I actually do that how do I um get what I want um anyway um so so that is the dishonest show I've got coming in um May perhaps it's not dishonest perhaps it's it's okay 
Um, it's okay to do that. Uh, uh, he's an interesting guy because he has looked into the unseen realm. And I was talking to Sethicus Bozar about, um, as you know, I had Sethicus on before, and Sethicus said, you can't have him on, I'm warning you, um, your life will be ruined if, if you have him on. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that on air, but I don't think um, Seth listens to my shows. Um, he said, oh, you can't, you can't, you can't. Um, I, I don't think that... I don't think that someone that practices um, black magic like um, Keating and other people, I don't think that just because you ask them things, they're going to um, throw that black magic at you or that um, it necessarily means that I am going to, if I'm talking to somebody who does that, that I'm going to um, start doing it. I did actually think, because I'm watching um, some of this guy's videos, and I have got a problem with one of my neighbours. He is, um, he started by when my, <clears throat> when my, um, my car, the alarm used to go off at nights. And this is about two years ago. And it went off three o'clock in the morning. I went out and I live in a very middle class English village, um, very middle class neighbourhood. It's very uptight. The house, I only rent, but their houses have gone up now. They're worth about three million. And, um, they're very, you know, house proud. Um, as the Pink Floyd said, you, you house proud town mouth, that um, animal song, which is so much about this area. Um, the radiate cold shards of broken glass is what comes to mind when you think of the people around here. And it's just a horrible area. You you just get a dirty look as soon as you go out the door. Um, it's, it's, it's horrible. I've just been down before I came up here. I've just been down polishing my windows because you have to get them really polished. If they're not really polished and really, really shiny, then people look in and give you a really mean look. I mean, it's just like <clears throat> it's a horrible, horrible area. And actually, I've just discovered the Hampstead, um, Hampstead child sex case that um, was going on. That involves, again, black magic I think or Satanism they're probably different black magic and Satanism and it was interesting to to listen to that and I'll come back to that subject in a minute but um it was interesting that they were talking about an area that was a cult area and when I came here and I was with um the overcomers ministry um online on Facebook this American woman who runs it she said, oh, you're in a cult area. And I said, oh, what do you mean? I said, these people aren't really interested in the occult, that's for sure. And she, she said, no, it's a cult area. And similarly, they, um, she believed, and others in that group believed, that there were certain pockets and areas where people were unconsciously in cults, even though they wouldn't say they were. It's kind of a um, an astral thing that they were in cults. Kind of made me think that maybe the um, Hampstead um, sex abuse thing, the 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 testimonies that the children gave of, of their abuse, that maybe it was an astral thing. Maybe they were meeting um, their father, these teachers, th these locals in this area, in the astral. I, it was just a thought. It might have um, it might have been that. And maybe um, you see what black magicians can do what adepts can do um they can pull you out of your body like as as you guys probably know i had the um the um experience with um colonel aquino because again in that group it was just kind of changed my life that's how i met douglas dietrich and that's how i got the show um anna hart in the overcomers ministry she had brought up Colonel Michael Aquino and said he had kicked off the programs, which actually isn't true because it was the Nazis that kicked off the programs. And actually, if you um, burrow down, it was beneath the Nazis. It is the fallen angels or at the bottom of the monarch um, programs, which led me then to believe that maybe it was an encounter with um, one of the fallen angels when I was a child, um, perhaps a sexual abuse encounter that has made me chase them down all of my life, maybe to get a part of myself back or what, I don't know, but there it is. And she mentioned Colonel Aquino and I thought, okay, I'm gonna track him, track him down and um, get my answers from him. And I did track him down and we were talking 
I sent him an email and it was quite an informal email. Oh, was it a formal one? The first one was a formal one. And then he basically, well, I was trying to go to sleep one night and a giant rabbit appeared in my mind. So it was really, really strong. And the rabbit stayed for a while, stayed really quite long until it made me feel like nauseous. And I think I got up, went to the toilet, splashed my face came down, tried to go to sleep again. Again, the rabbit was there, giant rabbit. I can see it's really pink eyes and its nose. And um, then it shot off really, really quickly. And a part of me that I'd actually been trying to um, get memories from that I called ice kind of lifted itself out of me and went shooting off after him. And then I closed my eyes and all of me kind of came out my body and um, went shooting, felt like I was shooting along the ground. And then I sunk down as if going straight, straight, straight down. And then I hit a bottom. And as soon as I hit the bottom of this rabbit hole, um, there was a keynote that I recognized from um, pictures. But I didn't need to recognize him. He um, had a certain scent. I knew it was him. And he said to me, what do you want? And so I thought, um, this is clearly the first part of the interview with him. Clearly, he doesn't respond to emails. He comes and gets people as a rabbit. But um, again, I'd been warned by a friend of mine called Christian, who said, oh, you shouldn't have sent that email to him. Oh, you know, he's um, he'll screw with you, which is kind of similar to the warning Seth has given to me about the um, Eric Keating guy. Oh, he'll ruin your life. Um, and I, I don't really heed that kind of stuff. So I had just gone ahead anyway. But I thought, wow, this is obviously, um, this is how this guy does his interviews. You know, when he was like, oh, what do you want? I said, oh, um, an interview with you, actually. About, and he, no, no, no. he said, what do you want? And so <clears throat> I said, oh, love, I, I love, I'd like to be in love. That's what I want, love. And then he um, brought me down this little, um, it was a kind of like a, um, a sort of corridor. And I went down the corridor and we came to a kind of opening. And in the opening, you could see like darkness and you could see all the planets. It was kind of looked like he was showing me the universe. And then he showed me, and I've, I know I've shared this before, but um, you know, you guys can turn off of your board. Um, it was a shape within a shape, like a tetra. I don't know what it was anyway. It was a shape within a shape that you climb inside. And basically he said, if you climb inside, you can, um, you can go any way you want. You can time travel and you can go to any era you want and any body you want, any um, any figure throughout history, you can get inside their body and experience um, their life. <clears throat> and um, I said, oh, that's, I can't remember what it said. Something like, oh, I, what about, um, yeah, he told me about the fallen angels. He said that um, the old God had disappeared and didn't exist anymore and that we are the fallen angels, which I thought was quite interesting because it kind of, in a way, it makes more sense because the fallen angels have been cast into the abyss and have been, no, 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 the fallen angels will be cast down to earth. And so it kind of makes sense that it's maybe us and um, we don't realize it, or some of us anyway. And um, he said the fallen angels are us. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know. But I kind of thought, yeah, I know that one. And um, then he said to, to, to get inside the thing, or he tried to get me to drink something, and I didn't. And then I said, I love Jesus. And as soon as I said Jesus, I kind of shot off, and I... Um, clash down into my body <clears throat> and then um, me and he talked over the email and as you guys know I've recently asked him to come on the show and he's agreed to come on the show um, I know Douglas Dutras is really unhappy about that um, and he stopped speaking to me there you go um, so I asked him to come on the show and um, he's just gone into hospital to have an operation he's got cancer and he said when he comes out he'll come on the show so that's in May <clears throat> also and um, so I got to know him via the email and Skype and then there was a, a week where 
he pulled me out of my body. He pulled me out of my body every night and I couldn't get any sleep because as soon as I put my head down, <clears throat> I was pulled out and um, he was there and he questioned me about what I was doing and who am I. And I said, I didn't, didn't actually know, but he kept on and on. And he said I was going to get success with what I was doing. And I'm writing, I don't know if it's with writing. He said, no, it's not your, um, not your books with what you're doing now. And I didn't really know what he meant, but he said, who are you working for? And what's your agenda? And I said, I didn't know. And then on the fourth time, I spent a week of not getting any sleep because as soon as I closed my eyes, my head was, brain was hijacked. It was just yanked out of my body and it was taken um, to just these awful places. One of them, I was shut in a room with um, marionette dolls and these dolls were all around and they had really, really chi China faces and, but their eyes, this is hard to um, talk about. Their eyes were alive. So it was like life was trapped behind the marionette doll. And I was shut in a room with these marionette dolls. And then I had a lot of flashbacks of um, my time in the orphanage. I was brought up in a Catholic orphanage. A lot of time there where I was, I had to watch men together and there was a guy there complaining that I wasn't wasn't good enough and to get another to get another child and um, just awful stuff of a, a girl walking away from me turning back and her she was like a doll but she was stuck behind the eyes the, her eyes were real and she was stuck behind there and I couldn't I couldn't have her it's like they had taken this little girl that was me and they wouldn't give me her back. And they knew I was looking for her, but they weren't going to give her back. And just awful stuff. And then the last, um, during that week, the, the one of the last days, I was taken out of my body again. And this time it was insectoid beings that were like greys with massive bug eyes. And they were poking and prodding at me. So... That was pretty horrid. And then I went to Laurie and Fenton. I think Douglas advised that I speak to Laurie and Fenton about it. So I spoke to Laurie and, and she said that it was abduction, alien abduction, and that some people have that every night. And well, it, I was crying my eyes out. I said, do you think that happened to me? Do you think that happened to me? Do you think I get stuck like that? And she's going, no, 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 you'll be fine. But I thought that I would get stuck like that. And there are people out there that are stuck like that. It must be a vision of hell, actually, to um, close your eyes and want sleep or shut down or a refreshing dream to just be just you're somewhere else and someone else has got control. That must be must be awful because I've experienced it myself. And so some people get abducted by the greys every single night, she was telling me, and every single night they get um, operated on. Um, they were only poking around at me. I didn't get any um, really bad sort of stuff. Recently, when I was in Rendlesham, they went for my mouth and I was going in and out of consciousness and they were like doing something um, in in my mouth, but my mouth was wedged open. I don't really know what that is, but I know they do the, <clears throat> the anal probes and they seem to be interested in... Um, fiddling around inside us and I don't know why that is and Laurie and Fenton said to me that some people just have that every night I just can you imagine that every night they oh, they try and <laughs> get some rest and they're just taken and she says um she give me the hovers to to recount this because it is horrible um I was literally sobbing I was terrified that I would that was it for me and because it did go on um too long and but it was odd during the day you'd expect if you've been conscious all night to be tired but I was I wasn't tired because my body had been resting my body had been asleep but 
my mind had been off. So it's a weird kind of a feeling. And um, she said that some people, um, when they go off, these people, where they go is called the slots. And I can't remember. <clears throat> I can't remember what she said about the slots, but it's it's where the greys take these um ab adoptees and they take them there um they take them there every um somebody said to me in the chat room a possible tooth implant i hope not but they were fiddling um um so yeah so so um so interesting interesting the slots whatever they are um these people get taken to the slots again and again and um eventually i went to um an occultist who told me different things and i won't go into them because it might be something that i can use as a barrier if i ever have attack which i i i do have um what she told me and she um basically told me to use these specific things and I could believe it was I think it was on about maybe the fifth night I can't I can't remember how many nights it went on but it was two it was one too many and it um it went and I had a night's sleep and I woke up the next morning and I thought okay I've broke this it means I can break it in the future and it didn't happen again um obviously I I've come out of my body again and again since then but um it hasn't been yanked out um like Aquino does yank it out and what he's doing with the grace I don't know but um he's going to come on the show so I can run all that past him um he might not want to speak about it or he might um he might speak about it I mean I did say to him about the rabbit thing I said was that you and he said he sent me a link to the Jefferson um airplane song and he said I'm going to update the lyrics to include our story um so I guess he does but he's not going to speak about it he then appeared to me so many times trying to get me to drink um something he kept saying join us join us join us and drink this drink this and then he threatened me um one time and um I didn't didn't go down too well because I don't like being threatened. And then he um, threatened my son and I said, OK, I'll drink it because I, I don't want anyone coming near my child in the astral or whatever. So um, I drank it. And it tasted like blood. It was really weird. I spat it out um, straight away. And then um, I managed to to block him. So um, nothing's happened since then. So I think that. I don't believe there's any such thing as being completely attacked with no defense. I mean, even against the greys, I think there is a defense. If anybody wants to ask me privately, um, I'll go into um, the modes of defense. But you can defend. But however, according to Laurie and Fenton, there are those people out there <coughs> who are taken by the greys constantly. And they are tortured every night they are um probed and they are operated on whatever that operating thing is that they are doing <clears throat> so um where was i i was talking yeah I, I don't know why i got into talking about um aquino uh, what are you talking about aquino yeah i thought that he knew about the monarch program so anyway he at the bottom line of the monarch um it's not aquino's bottom line it's not the Nazis. It is um, the one-up programs and the splitting of um, children. It was happened to me. I was um, shattered. Myself was shattered. I'm not. It's not the self that shattered. It's not a personality. It's not MPD. I disagree with that. It is the soul shattered. They shatter the soul and they take little bits of the soul and they do what they want um, to the soul. They either use it to. Um, I've been told recently that because I'm a creator i'm an artist i'm a writer <clears throat> that they um harvest my energy of that they take my ideas i've often seen my ideas in in different films such as um labor day and um the bridget jones diary not the bridget Jones diary the other the other movie i often see my ideas um harvested so you get your energy harvest um, they use one of my altars, soul altars as a um spy in the astral so various parts 
of me has been taken and it is the fallen angels that um, have given humanity um, these gifts, the same as the technology we've got is given given by them. So um, that, that is the bottom line. So why I invited um, Keating on the show is because he seemed to, um, he seemed to have come in contact with um, certainly one of them. I did have a channeled message that the um, the laws of the dark flame, whether it's them or not, are descending and they will be among us soon and they are causing more and more trouble on the earth and it's going to be racked up um, more and more as they descend um, into us as we kind of, um, I think we're ascending, they're descending. So there's going to be a um, kind of, they're, they're having more and more influence um, on the planet and so this chap who I invited on the show, um, he he came across one which I knew for sure. You know, I knew for sure that it was what I was looking for um, just by listening. And um, so, yeah, even though I think if you invite somebody on the show, how can you actually say to them, oh, I want your stash, by the way. Really, I'll be just asking them about their life. I won't be able to say. Maybe I will. I'm not sure. Anyway, that is is part of why I got the show to carry on my personal search and to make sense of different areas of my life. And um, interestingly, Miles Johnson kind of, he posts my shows under the basis, under basis 50, which is my um basis story and i've done these shows and mostly he posts them up and i get excellent feedback from people i've met a very good friend um i've made good friends um on that through through the people the, the basis community and um one in particular who i was talking about <coughs> who i dedicated the last show to with douglas dietrich that um yeah, I made a very good friend who knows a lot about um, astral travel and what to do and and where to go. And I've never encountered one of these beings. And I'm not sure why I want to um, encounter them. But I've never I've never tried. Um, I've never tried black magic myself. And I don't think I want to use um, the dark side to get close to one of them but then I suppose I don't know is is that is that the only way you can talk to the fallen ones through black magic do you have to go down that line do you have to say that um I don't know I'm not sure that you do because listening to Keating on his um lectures he he asks for things and he asks he certainly asked this um, entity, the one I'm interested in, um, that he called Azazel. He um, certainly asked him for things, and but I don't know. Do they really? Are they really interested in um, helping us? Um, clearly, cults and uh, satanic cults. Um, sometimes they commit murders and stuff to offer these beings blood sacrifices or doing bad things such as someone like Kenneth Bianchi who carried out his murders for the same um, Andy and Brady for the same thing it was like I'll give this to you and you will give me supernatural power and you will make my life better um, but do they really want to do that to humans um, I certainly didn't want it to encounter one to ask for money or supernatural power. Um, I can get money, I believe, if I pull my socks up and find work. And I don't want supernatural power. I'm okay as it is. I've got enough. Um, so I don't know. Do, do they do they want to give us help or, or, or what? I'm not sure someone like Akino who um, does this kind of praying thing or communion with them, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they actually enjoy him. Do they actually like Aquino? Do they think we really like him? We want to help him. We love you. Um, as Keating was saying, he came across him 
um, one of them, in the abyss, and he was sitting there all alone in the darkness. Now, I don't think that's a very happy place to be. So why can't we help them? Why can't we try and transmute them into some kind of light? Might they not need um, our help? And if you read the book of Enoch, God, it's pretty hard on them. I mean, they didn't do that much. And then he casts them out into the abyss without really giving them much of a chance. And I know I've had Mike Kaiser on the show and I've read his book, The Unseen Realm. He um, talks about how they betray God quite a few times. But if you read on the times that they are betraying God, it's not that bad. Not really. It's something that can be forgiven. And then when you think of God, who's supposed to be all loving and all forgiving, why did he cast them into the abyss where they'll be um, bound for um, eternity? It's pretty It's pretty harsh, really. Unless, of course, the God that we're reading about in the Old Testament and in Enoch isn't, um, isn't, isn't my God, isn't... Um, isn't the proper God. And then one has to think, well, is Odin the God? Is it my God? Perhaps we're all in different little boxes and perhaps a certain person might enjoy a really spiteful God who's nasty. Perhaps there are people that think, yeah, that's cool. But I personally don't think that's really cool. I think it's kind of really um, spiteful. And um, I think if I'd have been Keating coming across this character in the abyss with these snakes and I wouldn't have said to him oh do you think you can give me a Porsche or whatever he said to him I don't think he probably said a Porsche I haven't got that far in um watching um haven't really listened into what he did say to him I believe it's in other um videos but surely this entity if it's stuck like that needs um needs needs something that we've got perhaps it needs something that we've got and perhaps, perhaps we should look at that. Perhaps we should look at doing some kind of trade that doesn't involve um, murdering innocent people or drinking blood or um, anything petty and um, disgusting and that we shouldn't be doing. Because really, if you think about it, these cults, um, that Hampstead was talked about, whether it's true or not, I don't know. This area seems cultish to me. It does seem that there's a coven somewhere um, because it's so cold and it's so materialistic. Um, I've got a neighbour opposite and he basically, because um, my alarm was going off, I went out, there I am, a woman, woman, and I went out, I was in my nightdress, and um, three o'clock in the morning, and he was pacing around my car, and trying to look threatening, and I'm like, excuse me, just because I'm a single mother, doesn't mean I don't know really, really hard guys, because actually, I worked for the sun, I worked for the sun, I worked for the sun back then, I worked for the sun, and I'm a crime journalist, so I know like gangsters, and I know terrorists, and, you know, you're kind of standing there looking threatening at me like, oh, she's a woman. She doesn't know any guys. She's got no protection. I have really, really, really know some badass guys. Anyway, he just looked at me like a deer caught in headlights. And then he ran inside and his wife had come out at that point. She goes, oh, you've really gone too far. And I'm like, no, I haven't really gone too far, you know. And then my car alarm um I managed to um, yank it out. And ever since then, this guy's been completely obsessed with me. And whenever I park near his car, he looks at his car, which is a piece of shit. It must be worth all of £100. And then he rubs it little spaces on it. And, okay, he lives in a really moneyed house, but he's he makes an idol of his house. And he makes an idol of his piece of shit car. And he's rubbing at it. And he looks at my car and then he'll look at bits on it as if, and he did this, you know, fairly often. And he never says anything to me. He just has his arms folded and with his little golfing um, Ralph Lauren shirt and his golfing pastels he's got. And I said to him, do you want my insurance um, details? Do you think I've done something 
to you. And um, he just didn't speak to me and he went in. And it is it is intimidating. Someone doesn't speak to you. Not that I was afraid of him. You know, he's this little short guy. And um, this went on. And then I found um, two nails, one in the front of my car and one in the back on the same side. I didn't think anything of it. But when I got my tires changed, they said um, that it was malicious. So I called the cops and I said about him. So they went over and spoke to him. And um, then I was checking under my wheels every morning like um, someone in a goddamn terrorist organization to see if there's any nails every morning. It's kind of inconvenient when I'm doing a school run. And so I was doing this every morning. He saw me doing it. Anyway, next thing, um, two nights ago, I parked my car up the road and he had slashed the tires. Okay, I can't say it's him. And oh, I'm saying on the radio it's him. Nobody knows where I live, so that's okay. Um, but of course it's him because <laughs> he would have seen me checking for the nails and thought, oh, I won't do that anymore. I'll slash them. They were slashed to bits and um, I got the cops again and I just had the cops... Um, <laughs> Someone said in the chat room, who else would it be? I don't know if they meant that, like, who else would it be, man? Or who else would it be? Um, I can only think, unless it's Dr. Evan Harris from Hacked Off, who's really pissed off with me. Um, I don't know. It might be Heather Mills. She's pissed off with me because we did a scam at the um, with the Sunday's paper with Nick Parker. She's just found out about it and... Um, She's pissed off. So I don't know. I can't imagine her, though, getting down. She's got one leg. She's crouching down at my car, um, you know, putting the leg sort of to the side or something and then kind of stabbing at it, you know, and then kind of getting up, you know, uh, and driving off. I can't see that happening. And she knows I got sack from the sun because of her, um, because of a conversation we had. And she went and put it on her website, not there anymore. Um, and then Rebecca Brooks said that I was completely unprofessional. I should have slammed the phone down on her. Well, I didn't slam the phone down on anybody. I was trying to calm her down because they had done a scam on her, but they had forgot to not um, make the emails News International. So she knew it was us. So I thought, well, I'll calm her down. And she was busy saying how um, she was upset and the press um, had made her out to be a prostitute years and years ago. And her daughter, Beatrice, would um, come across these pictures of her. And so I was just trying to calm her down. And um, she was, like, really angry at me. But then eventually um, we kind of got on. She said, you don't need to work for the sun. You know, my... Um, Bavarian boyfriend he just gets by on a little money he won't take any money from me and you don't need that and god it was like this wicked fairy because then the next day I got the sack and um when she pasted it on the website and there I was you know next thing I was getting by on um a pound a day or whatever you know ever since then um I've been out of work so I don't think it it is Heather Mills um, doing that to my car. But um, what I thought, you know, here I am and I feel under siege from my neighbour for no apparent reason. It appears that it's a tit for tat. It appears that, oh, he thinks I've dinged his car and, um, you know, it's escalated and it's absurd. It's really absurd. Um, the police are going to try and mediate, which is where they sit us down. But the the police officer who dealt with me said, oh, um, he might not agree. He, he's not going to agree because he's like, you know, he's got a real problem with me. Um, and I thought to myself, I would love to do a really evil spell on him. And that's the only time I've ever considered um, doing something kind of black magical. I thought if, if... I could do some kind of really, really, really nasty, really nasty, like horrible spell on him. Like, you know, he feels like loads and loads of pain and that he knows it's me. And then he has to leave me alone. Then I would. And then I thought to myself, well, where do you draw the line? You know, where do you, um, what kind of person am I, you know, that, um, what kind of person am I that I would, if I had the ability, would I go down that line? And I thought, would I? And I thought, yeah, I, I actually would go down that line. And, um, yeah. And then I thought to myself, well, 
perhaps that's why we haven't got any supernatural power because if we did have supernatural power we would kill each other just straight away you know i know i would get stuck in i've got a list of people that i would just you know i just wouldn't give a damn i wouldn't give a damn if they died really really painfully you know so that's probably why we haven't got supernatural powers because we can't really um we can't really be trusted we can't really be trusted and i would like to meet a fallen angel but maybe i'm not to be trusted because what would i do if i met a fallen angel i'd say hey there's a neighbor across the road you can um you can just wipe him out could you you know so maybe that's why we're in the position we are where we can't commune with um we can't commune with the angels we're stuck like um farm animals because we're we're corrupt and angry and just bad really bad to the bone we're we're good if we're not tested if we're like having a nice time and we're not we're not um tested at all um and then Somebody said in the chat room, why is the serpents harmless as doves? Um, <laughs> we're quite angry. If really this is like the Wild West, we'll be like murdering each other. I know myself personally, I liked it when I lived in Belfast and I was able, because I was working for the News of the World, I was able to hang out with the IRA. I was able to hang out with the UDA who, I mean, the UDA um, were literally hanging out their windows of where they live on these estates with machine guns, which was um, interesting and exciting. I think we're going to break, so um, join me again um, after the break. We've got a three minute break. freedomslips.com be here wednesday evening at 8 p.m eastern time for private eye matrix revealed with monique lasson challenge let's give him one the 
voice that whispers in your ears are the screams that you fear. The mind you cannot defy is the heart that rules mankind. The people who made you are the gods that will save you. I am Steve Travesty. I am the voice. The ghost in the machine. Ghost in the machine. Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Studio A. Right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Hi, it's Christine Joanna Hart. We're back, back on air. Here we are, actually, back on air. Things have gone very, very quiet. I'll just check with my producer. Uh, yeah, this is Patrick English, and oh, I just okay. um, do a little station. What's going on? I wanted to pump up the station a bit, just just to get this in. Um, I think I've lost. Um, I've lost a connection. No, no, I'm not on air anymore. Fine. You're fine. You're definitely not on air. I can't hear. Huh? You're on mute. Hang on. I'll be right with you. Um. Anyway, you're listening to freedomslips.com. Oh, fine. sorry, Patrick. Sorry, I was on mute and That's I couldn't unmute. Off. Sorry, you carry on. Okay. And Revolution Radio is the biggest uh, user-supported station on the net. And we've been going for five years, and that's a record, actually, over five years. And we are here because of you. And we need your help. We have about $580 to go. It is the 21st day of the month. We've got nine days left. I know we can do it. And I know times are hard, but even 5 or $10 could really help out a whole lot. If everyone gave that, we'd be three months ahead. And if you are as rich to give $100 or $50, you get as good as you give because we will give you the jumbo seed pack should you ask for it. Or for $50, you get the bullet drive or you get a one ounce silver bar. It's a little ingot. It's $9.99 pure. And silver is more valuable than gold right now. So it's a good idea to get it. And it's, it's as pure as you can get. The archives are four ninety nine a month. You can get a subscription to them, too. We have the uh, Zazzle store. And one more thing, with, with the bullet drive and the other stuff, which I say is uh, USA only due to constraints with borders and stuff like that, um, is that you need to give us your mailing address so we can get it to you. Otherwise, they'll send it all to me. And... Just kidding. Anyway, uh, with that, and the, again, please help us. With that, I am going to turn it over to Christine again. Hi, everybody. Um, Christine Joanna Hart, Christine Joanna Hart Show, and it's London, coming in live from London. And Patrick, if you want to have any ring ins, if there's anybody, you said there was David Lloyd um, He's there. If, at- what? He's in the chat, and then I put the numbers. Uh, you can call in. It's 347-688-2902, or you can call my Skype, which is 337-335-0085. Those are both written in chat, and I put them up every time it rolls off chat. Or you can Skype Freedom Screen, like a theater screen. So, yes, go ahead and give us a holler. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, if, if anybody, thanks very much, Patrick. Um, thanks, Patrick, there. Patrick Anglish is my producer. And, yeah, so if anybody wants to ring in, if they've got any questions um, about what I was talking about, feel free to ring in. And the Skype is Freedom Screen. Is that all one word? Yes, it is, all lowercase. Okay, so that just means, so what do they do? They just ring it and basically get us, yeah? Patrick? 
Well, Patrick. I went on mute. You see, I do that to stay out of your way. Anyway. <laughs> So, uh, so, 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 they just have to ring. Yeah. Freedom. Sc- oh, okay. Kushti. Okay. So, anybody wants to um, join in with me or ch- ask me questions or generally whatever, do give us a ring wherever you are in America or England. It's um, eight o'clock in England, <clears throat> and it's getting dark out there. It's it's kind of freezing. It's been quite warm all day, but um, it's getting freezing. I just. Um, oh. I just um, checked on my neighbor across the road. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote, I shouldn't go on about my neighbor. I, I wrote him a little note. I see my ties are slashed. <laughs> but um, then he actually said to the police, when I was talking to the police this afternoon, he said, um, I'm hassling him because I sent him a note. Oh, right, I'm hassling him. He is goddamn stalking me. No, he's not stalking me. He's stalking my car. He is just like completely obsessed with my car, and my car is just like, I mean, it's it's an estate car, but I I wouldn't call it much, you know. I mean, I appreciate really beautiful cars like Lamborghinis, and I used to drive when I was working for the News of the World. I, I had a Lotus, and it was a soft top, and it was beautiful. Um, but now I can care less what he does to the car, but it's costing me um, so much money. It's so expensive. And I'm a single mother and I'm not working. And it's kind of absolutely disgusting for someone um, who owns his own house, who's clearly he's retired and um, he's he's doing that. You know, I think he's retired anyway. He's he, he looks about 50. He's got dyed black hair. Um, anyway, I mustn't, God, I can just imagine, um, him taking this show to the cops and announcing that I'm hassling him on air. So he's anonymous. Nobody knows where I live. Nobody knows what neighbors I've got. So, um, nobody knows. So I'm certainly not hassling him, but I'm sure he would try to, um, make that into some kind of issue. I'm sure, I hope God, imagine if he was stalking me online and kind of listening right now. Gosh, how creepy. Maybe he is. Um, anyway, he is so unimportant. What the important point I was trying to make is if one does have supernatural um, abilities, would we go and use them against people constantly? And I say with my hand up at the front, I would use them um, straight away on somebody like that. And if you think about it, that is such a... Um, such a small thing it's really small but i would do it and then if you think about the lives of the saints and if you think about um if you think about something like buck who wrote the book cosmic consciousness and about saints and about i think john the baptist is in there definitely jesus um is in there who had supernatural powers who had um who had um cosmic consciousness who do have this kind of thing they follow a certain pathway where they do turn the other cheek when they're shit on and they do turn the other cheek when they're stolen from and you know i think the paths of magic i think magic is is fine but the different paths i think it depends what kind of person you are and it's really, really hard. People say that black magic is the left-hand path and good magic or cosmic consciousness is the right-hand path. But And then people think if they're not um, <coughs> chanting or doing um, really bad rituals or spilling human blood that they're right-hand path people. But actually, they're not right-hand path people because if they did have any kind of powers, then they would unleash the furies on um i don't know sometimes maybe they'd unleash the furies on somebody that dumped them you know you're going out with someone you fall madly in love and all of a sudden they're off with somebody else would you unleash the furies on them i like to think that i wouldn't but one one never knows someone like that opposite me giving me a hard time where it costs me money it makes me stressed out it makes me kind of scared and on edge and I'm thinking about it all the time. So he's made me unhappy. He's managed to kind of rape me and um, he's made me unhappy. So I would just like to absolutely 
give it to him back. So if I did have any kind of um, involvement with any higher entities that did have that power and I did kind of grab that, then I probably would chuck it back, chuck it back over. So what I'm trying to say is maybe this um, teaching like Jesus teachings to live a certain way and to be a certain person, like if you get stolen from to offer the thief more money, if you um, – get hit to offer the other cheek to, to, um, I should probably offer him up another tire. I should probably leave a tire on his doorstep. I should just take one of my tires off or even the spare in the back and just God, and put it on his doorstep to save him the trouble of stalking around the street with a black balaclava on or whatever he does. I should just go and put it there. Um, so yeah, to, 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 to turn the other cheek to, um, I like to think that I'd be this kind of person, but when one is tested, then then one, I think one is tested in life. And then I think that you, I think that most of us fail. I, I'm failing my um, lesson right this minute. I'm failing it because I, firstly, I'm letting it get to me and I'm not having faith in God that God will take away the pain that God will sort it all out, that <clears throat> I can pray to the parking gods. I do believe in different gods. Um, I can pray to the parking gods, lesser gods, obviously, than the creator, um, to look after my car. And it's hidden at the moment. It's hidden many, many streets away, woven in and out of other cars. So it's crouched in hiding, which seems kind of weird. But... It's all I can do, but I could pray and have faith that he won't touch it or I could leave it right outside his house and know that he's going to come in the darkness and, and stab it and just change the wheel and just pay and just keep paying, keep paying, keep paying and know that God will kind of make it okay and to do it with love and say to myself, it's okay. I don't know, but I think going down that pathway is so really hard. I suppose it's like Christ with his um, being whipped and then finally laying there on the cross when he's had, you know, all his tires slashed, his body is slashed. There he is. And he's like, Father, forgive them. So he's the ultimate person that deserves supernatural powers because he can completely deal with them, completely purified humanity that can rise up at notches. And I don't think we're wanted on the higher levels because of the way we are. And I think we reincarnate again and again because of the way we are, because we're quite small creatures. And I think because our wants are quite small, like, oh, I want to be famous. Oh, I want a big house. Oh, I want this. I want that. You know, I want to have great sex. I want a husband who's really, really rich to look good as well I want to be pampered I want to sit around wearing a pink dress all the time I want to eat a pink cupcake I just want to be pampered I want people to think I'm special I want to be rich I want to be famous I want to have a really really big villa that's very special with roses climbing up the outside I want to come out of that villa and I want people who are passing to look at me and think wow she's special we want all those things for ourselves and really, they're just selfish. It's so petty. No wonder there's a thing above us. Really, do we need actually a thing to stop us ascending? It's because we're so petty and tiny and small. And even these people that are like sometimes comment under my shows, oh, you're a bad person, though. Oh, you need to open your heart chakra. Yeah. What, <laughs> what is that? You're having a go at me. You know, you're a bad person yourself because you're judging me. And where's your heart chakra in all this? So even those people are full of shit and they're ascend they're not going to ascend either. So we're kind of stuck here because we behave in a really, really bad way. And there's this Jesus Christ figure who told us how to live. We don't want to do that because it's really, really boring. And we don't want to turn the other cheek when people are mean to us. All we want to do is just take revenge and, you know, a really, really nasty revenge. I mean, if I saw that guy dying in front of me, I would actually, 
I don't know. I don't think I would feel good. I would just not feel anything, and I could just watch. And he might reach out a hand to try and help. Oh, help, help. And I would just watch. I think, what about you? You made me think about you all the time. I could be sitting on my telly watching a really good film and enjoying it, but I'm not because I had to think about you. I had to think about tyres. I had to think about money because I know you're going to attack my tyres. So I couldn't relax. And I would like to see him really suffer to feel better because he'd sucked up my time instead of forgiving him and trusting everything will be okay sort of turning the other cheek and say well he doesn't really understand what he's doing he doesn't really understand how much he's hurting me how much he's making me feel really really afraid in my own goddamn home where i certainly i certainly do pay enough rent for this place um anyway i want to talk about the hampstead uh, movie so that is the shows that are coming up. I'm just doing an update for my show. That's the shows coming up. We've got Joseph Farrow. We've got EA Keating. And check them both out. They're really interesting people. And I'm still checking I'm still checking them out. So they're coming in May. Um, we might have Michael Aquino coming in May if he survives his cancer um, operation. I know a lot of people out there have got hate on for him. Um I'm just going to talk to him. So <clears throat> I know a few people don't want him on the show. Um, Douglas Dietrich doesn't want him on the show. And now he's not speaking to me, so he can't even say why. He's one of those people that um, don't speak. So he's vanished, um, which is a shame because um, we were very, very good friends. We would talk most mornings on Skype and have a laugh. And it's very sad that he's he's gone. <coughs> He actually, he was my, <laughs> he was my only birthday present, my birthday last year. I didn't get any presents from anybody. Oh no, I'm lying. I did, um, I did get one present from a friend, um, but mostly it was like, oh, I didn't know it was your birthday. But um, Douglas sent me um, a lovely leather bound copy of Brave New World and some flowers all the way from America. So that was lovely. I mean, that's how much of a good friend he was. And we fell out over Michael. So um, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why some people end up not speaking to people and why friendships fail. But it's sad. I've just seen on Facebook that he's been banned from Facebook because of his last show. So I'm thinking maybe he was going on about how much he hates the Jews. Um, anyway, somebody has also mentioned to me about um, run flats that can't be slashed. Um, so I'm going to look into that. I think it's weird, actually, that in England and America or anywhere that they don't have things like steel hubs that you can lock up your tyres. I mean, it, it, it's a thing that does happen. So... <laughs> Isn't there such a thing as even if they were like two hundred pound each, you had to take a loan out to buy them? It's you know, it's something that everywhere's on lockdown. Your house is on lockdown, and you know, but there's this thing that you can't protect. It seems, I don't know, it seems weird, and it's so creepy that this guy is like raping my tires. You know, it feels like he's raping my mind. I mustn't obsess about it. Certainly not my show. I've probably bored everyone, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, back to um, talking about areas. This, um, the Hampstead um, satanic sexual abuse um, story, as most of you know, I, in my Vatican run orphanage, was um, open to the same um, SRA, I believe. Certainly, I remember my adoptive father's sexual abuse, and it was all connected with the church and I was put into the convent. My aunt was a nun and she wanted me to be um, a nun. So I was put in the convent taught how to pray using meditation. They pray with meditation. They're pretty much into the occult themselves, the Catholic church, but it's all, <laughs> it's all on lockdown, that kind of thing. It's all kept for um, insiders. So um, eventually they decided that I wasn't, um, they didn't want me to be a nun which is based on the fact that I liked George Harrison, which is weird, and wore mascara. So um, I was chucked out of there. That was the convent in Boston. They've got them all around the world. And 
so yeah so that that is that that was my kind of um I don't I don't know whether I, I was subject to SRA, but certainly memories that I've got coming back and certainly people talking to me about um, Monarch programming and the fact that I've um, Fritz Springmeier says he believes that I've been open to um, the Monarch programs, Alice in Wonderland um, programming specifically. And so I have my own experience of SRA. So. Oddly, the um, owner of the um, the owner of the the Revolution Radio Hawk sent me a link to the Hampstead SRA um, case, and he said, "Oh, does this go on in your country? It's disgusting in your country." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, England, yeah, England's not a great great place. It's it's." Um, in northern areas, it's nicer. It's the people are warmer, but there's a lot of interest in just social activities and a lot of mindlessness. And then in London, where it's a bit probably a little bit higher minded, it's very uh, materialistic, incredibly materialistic, and it's horrible, really. And in the other poorer areas, it's kind of this racial tension um racial tension in, in those areas it's not a great country it's it, it's it's not i wouldn't say it's a happy country and <clears throat> he he sent me the link to the Hampstead thing i hadn't listened to it because i find it hard to um face child abuse there's a certain part of me that doesn't want to admit that it goes on because then when i do up comes mine so I have to stay in that position where oh, I don't want to look at that that doesn't go on which I know is 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 stupid and I can't stay in that um and actually I thought last night here I am under siege by my neighbor I feel really shitty so I guess it doesn't matter if I feel even shittier and my um ritual abuse from my past comes up and so I listened to the um the link and it was interesting. It was more interesting than I thought. I thought it would be these. If anybody hasn't um, hasn't seen it, um, there's a chap called Jensen who, um, on his YouTube channel, he has um, kind of cut and spliced and put it into a long story where you can um, see everything that's happened. And he starts off with the two. In case I had a, somebody, some of you listening don't know the story. Um, basically two children um, from Ham Hampstead, which isn't that far from here. It's the same kind of village. It's a very moneyed um, suburban part of London. It's a village. They call it a village, which actually means that everyone gossips and it's incredibly clicky. The schools are clicky. Everywhere's clicky. Um, it's just like here. It's like a, a sister to here. And um, which I can tell you is horrible. You enter into it and it's just like, I can feel it. Sometimes when I go um, sort of a couple of miles away and I spend a lot of time like maybe in a park and I come back to this area, I can literally feel it. It's almost like something sticky and horrible clings to me. It's like makes me really feel bad. It's it's awful. It's an awful area. And you just literally walk down the street, you'll get a dirty look from someone and they'll look you up and down if you're not absolutely um, dressed in Chanel with your hair perfectly um, coiffed. It's like a Stepford wife area. And it's it's very, um, there's no life in it. It's like uniform and there's very decent, lots of decent cars. My neighbor's not got a decent car, but there's plenty of um, moneyed cars but they're very subtle you know it's not showy exciting sexy cars it's like you know suburban kind of um conformed um cars like top of the range this top of the range that and there's many many four by fours there's plenty of four by fours um and people wearing wellies and hats and pretending that they're the aristocracy um even though they're not they're not in the country but they dress like that and it seemed to me that knowing this kind of area, it made me kind of prick up my ears and think, oh, and especially over what Anna Hart said in the Overcomers Ministry, when I complained to them about this area, they were like, oh, it's a cult area. And I said, what do you mean by that cult? 
And it, they said it's a cult area. I said, no, these people wouldn't get into um, cults. And they said, yeah, 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 they are. And I have to say, I still don't really get what they meant. I think they did explain to me quite a few times, but the penny didn't drop. Um, I think what they uh, meant is that um, possibly it's unconscious, possibly it's in the astral, possibly they meant that you're connected even though you don't, possibly they meant it's in family bloodlines and that people, um, somebody just saying now, oh, my, my producer, thanks, Patrick, maybe they're all Freemasons, but possibly I would say from this area, yes. Um, so, yeah, I suppose it is a cult Um the women are cults, and they said something about it. It's, um, it's, um, yeah, it's not really cult. No, they were saying um, that it's possibly bloodline. <laughs> they are a, a certain type. I, I didn't get on with them. I really kind of clash because there's no um, real going on. And um, so I was listening to that, and I thought, okay, it was really hard to. The children had so much detail, and so much of it was. Um, it's horrible to listen to, but. It does sound like that kind of um, satanic stuff. So I'm thinking, where do they get it from? And it might have been their mother kind of downloaded into their mind, but they were literally talking as if they had experienced it. And I was wondering, maybe it was an astral experience, so they think it's real. Maybe they had continued consciousness, perhaps. And they don't know the difference. They don't know that you don't have it, maybe. I don't know what happened to them when they were really small was the wife involved and then she split off with him i i don't know um i nobody's investigated it and i've just come across it um last night or was it two nights ago but something really re recently so i've only seen this one thing <coughs> about it and um then it had the father come on who was just completely drop dead gorgeous he was kind of strange. You kind of look at him and think, well, if anybody is going to lead an occult, a lead a cult, it would be somebody who looks really, really gorgeous because um, when these cult leaders, the women have to all have sex with them. So he would be somebody that I would say, like, thousands of women would want to have sex, sex with. He was absolutely gorgeous. So you're kind of thinking, hmm. But he seemed to really, really love his children. And I couldn't imagine him hurting them. Maybe, no, I, I just couldn't. I have to be honest. I couldn't imagine hurting him. And then the wife came on. She seemed okay. And then um, Jensen finished the video by saying, and then the next thing, the children were taken into care. And then they retracted everything and said it was all a lie. And so we, as the viewer, we as the public, we as decent, you know, there's decent people out there, maybe not around me at the moment, um, but we're thinking, oh, um, firstly, we're thinking, where are the children now? It's like, I think the public deserve to see them. <laughs> we deserve to see them constantly. We deserve to have them flashed on the TV. They're okay. Or in a newspaper. Yeah, they're okay. So we can all go, oh, they're okay. I mean, because these children, I mean, even if it was just downloaded into them, it's kind of horrible. So they've been touched by um, satanic stuff anyway. Satanic, um, God, I think we need to think of a new word for it. It's like, um, hmm, it's like humans going down the so-called um, dark pathway who um, believe that you have to um, do this kind of sex stuff or do this hurting people or hurting children to kind of gain supernatural power. So kind of, it's like, um, it's like cheating because actually to get supernatural power, you've got to become a really goddamn good person and like a saint, then it's given to you. I mean, Buck's cosmic consciousness, it's given to them and they can do all sorts of shit because they've been really, really, really um, good, which is hard work. But the other way, it's kind of disgusting. Who wants to have an orgy? Who wants to kill somebody? Who wants to be really, really filthy? Because you know what? The fallen angels are going, God, you're a dirty lot of bastards, aren't you? And they're just kind of laughing at us. I mean, they don't need they don't need that shit. They don't, um, they don't need to do it. They're just thinking, hmm, look at them, you know? So um, going back to what I was saying, this... Um, I don't know if they've had that put inside them, but it is really ugly, ugly, ugly stuff. And 
God, they need to be near really, really, really loving people, really, really spiritual people, people that know what's gone on with them and people that um, show them kindness and people that show them real. What pe If people have suffered lots and lots of pain, they go into the um, post-traumatic stress disorder state, which I've experienced myself, and if they're surrounded by um, people that are unreal, even if the, even if they're being kind, if they're unreal, keeps them locked in this um, state. What they need is gentle, really, really, really loving kindness. Um, when I went to get myself cured of post-traumatic stress disorder, I went to um, the Primal Institute in Los Angeles and my um, therapist there was a guy called Dr. Barry Bernfeld and he was soft and so, honestly he was I thought he was Jesus himself he was like an angel and he pulled me out of this um, my sort of bubble because you just kind of end up in a bubble because you're so hurt that you can't come out into the world because it was like oh no thanks and um, it needs someone to bring you out of it to bring your feelings out of the ice and he did that to me and he was so soft so kind and that's what these children need they really really need that and I'm not convinced that care workers because I've been um, in care myself um, when I was a kid that um, when my adoption didn't work out my adoptive family put me back into the orphanage it was like oh there you go back there um, it's riddled with pedophiles it's riddled with people that are really really screwed up um, it's riddled with really bad people I'm not convinced that the people in the care system where those children are are able to give those children what they need to heal from their post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm really, in fact, I could think I could say that 100% it's not going to happen. So I'm just like horrified where those children are, what's happening to them, how are they going to um, come back to us because they're being pushed into something which is it's like something that human beings create that it's a um full state almost to that state that i was abducted to it's like they're in the slots they're in slots and none of us doing anything about it and they're just there and they're just little kids no one can help them they're there no one's gonna help them it's just us so i think if we all get together and we all pray for them if we can just pray for them as much as we can and demand there's a cop out there called ray savage and he um he was um at the end of this jensen's youtube um on the Hampstead case he was um outside somewhere and he was lobbying i'm trying to get him to come on the show he was lobbying and he oh when he was talking He's one of those good people. And when he was talking, I could just feel that he was just just real and safe. And he was a cop. And actually, you do find it in the uh, police. Sometimes you do find really good, warm, real people. I had the, um, the guy that was helping me today. Um, he was called Stuart. I can't remember his second name. I shouldn't say it on air anyway. Um, he was warm. He actually made me cry. And I wasn't crying so much because of the state I'm in and, and living in fear. And I'm not really sleeping. You know, who knows if he's not going to put a brick through the window. I don't know how loopy Louie is. So I'm not sleeping. Um, I've got a little boy to protect. And um, it's worrying me. And he was really kind. It's just, you know, kind. And I cried. It was like he was melting the ice around me and it's like when something bad happens like when something bad happens to those two little children th they're only eight and nine that ice forms around you and that's the um post-traumatic <coughs> post-stress traumatic disorder state where you're almost like under a river and um there's ice on top of that and you can't get out to the world to communicate with the world so you're kind of stuck in there and it's like it's almost scary to kind of crack the ice and get back up and join the world because after all you suffered then you went down into this kind of cloven pine kind of state and it's hard to get out and what needs to be done those children will be in that um, state where they cut off from everything and it 
what they need is for the ice to melt and for them to come back to us. And it would just be fantastic if these little angels came back to us. And, you know, it needs someone to go in there, whether it's him or not, but someone like him to go in there and just to be with them and to make sure they're safe. And we as a public and America, England, every country that knows about it needs to know that they're safe. Thanks very much. Um, we've got Madeleine McCann. We don't know that she's safe. We have to have that trauma of thinking about her. Where is she? So it's like, you know, we as a public get traumatized too by having to listen to it. Then we have to think, where's the child? And then we have to think, where's those children? And then we're traumatized too. And then we get a little bit icier because you think, well, I can't get to those children. <coughs> I can't be, um, I can't help them. I could feel bad about it, but life is making me feel bad. I need to watch TV now and I need to chill out. So you get even more colder inside and cold parts of your head. And so it kind of um, kind of does that to us. Who's the enemy wanting to do that to us? Is it the fallen angels doing it to us? I'm starting to think that actually it's it's us. And, you know, we are the really, really bad, bad ones. And we've got to stop being bad and start being good. And we've got to stop being materialistic and start thinking about other people, start being warmer, start being nicer, start turning the other cheek when we're shit on. There's many, many bad people in the world and we're always going to meet bad people, we're always going to be offended by them. We've got to stop, <coughs> stop being offended and start, start being one of the good guys, even though it might seem boring. It doesn't mean you can't talk to a fallen angel. It doesn't mean you can't go to them and have a chat with them. It doesn't mean you can't actually travel if you feel like it. It doesn't mean that. It just means you're going to be good. You're not going to be bad. And <coughs> I really do hope that something can be done about the two kids in, in, in that case. And... I know it goes on in England, everywhere, that kind of thing. And it's awful. It does go on. There's no point in us saying, oh, they were talking shit. It hasn't gone on. Whether it's um, astral or physical, it's still gone on. I personally think, <coughs> because they were talking about teachers and things like that, that it's probably... It's probably in the astral. It probably is. That's that's what's the um, key to it that um, they're not seeing. It's probably that, I would say. And a lot of this stuff does go on there. And that makes the astral a kind of filthy, dirty place. And it shouldn't be a filthy, dirty place. But it is. <clears throat> I can't get there consciously when I want. Sometimes I find myself there. Um I can't come. I can't come out my body at will. I can't travel at will. Sometimes I kind of try to, and then I find myself there. But sometimes, mostly, I try to, and I can't. Um, I did travel with Dan Bolin. I know Dan Bolin as Sergeant Dan Bolin has shared about it um, on various shows and having these uh, missions to um, alter CERN. And I. You know, while I respect what he does, I'm not sure that it can um, do everything because I, I know that MI6, MI5 will have all of that covered. You know, if you watch Inception, you can see that they do have defences. They do. They are aware of all this. They do have remote viewers. They have the lot. They have more than we have. Uh, well, they don't actually have more than we have, but they have people that are defending so I'm not sure that missions to attack CERN are going to work, but I'm not going to disrespect what he does. Um, I had somebody contact me. Um, he sometimes listens to the shows. Um, he contacted me anonymously and he called himself um, Alex, Alexander. And he, there was no picture, but he friended me. And I got the um, feeling from his energy that he was okay to accept, even though there was no picture or profile. And then he started talking to me. He didn't say much, but he said um, that he wanted me to come on a mission 
with him at a certain hour and did I want to time travel with him? And I thought, okay, you've got good energy, but that's nuts. So I said, yeah, 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 that's okay. I'll come with you. And he said, you've got to give me permission. So I said, okay, there's permission. You have permission. And he set a time. I think it was like, um, it was either 12.04 or 3.04, something like that. And I was just drifting off. And then I felt myself like drinking something. And it was almost like cough mixture I had, um, <coughs> cough mixture I had growing up quite a lot, pink cough mixture. And I heard one of these people around me say, oh, they give you that to put the programming in place. And then I sunk down like lucidly, even though my body was asleep, I was really lucid and um, lucid dreaming, they call it. And I sunk down various levels of my childhood. I found myself going back to (coughs) 15, 10, down the years, down the years, and then... um, I saw myself as a baby and then I saw myself coming out of my mother. My mother was just 13. She had me in the orphanage and then just passed me over. (coughs) Well, she kept me for a while. She was in a mother and baby home. She kept me for a while and um, then ran off with me. And then she gave me back, left me on the um, doorstep of the um, convent. And then I was um, basically put in care. And um, I saw her and I always thought that she didn't have much feeling for me, but she was crying and I was watching her. And then these people, um, which Alexander was a part of, um, he confirmed later, um, said to me, now we want to see what happened to you. And basically they took me off and they took me to a certain place where they um, checked my blood type and then they put me into a cage and then I started seeing the um, puppies cut up, the um, sexual abuse, and just the whole fucking gamut of um, similar things to what those children have. Um, not all, but um, that kind of crap. And it was part of the Vatican, part of the church. And um, and then I, then we seemed to go, I went with them on some kind of, which seemed like a kind of a trip somewhere where we wore silver suits. And um, then the following day, um, I I came back to my body. And then the following day, I said to Alexander, I said, did you get any of that? Because you took me through time and I went back to um, my um, birth. And he said, yeah, 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 I did. He said, then um, we took you off somewhere. And he actually, um, it was the first time that I'd ever um, journeyed with someone and they had said, yes, we did ABC. So um, that was, that was fairly, um, that was fairly um, interesting that, that I'd done that for the first time. (laughs) But I have to say it was more him than me. He literally pulled me and took me down my timeline. I didn't do that. Um, on my own and he's um actually someone that um is very good friends with Duncan Cameron and Duncan Cameron has been um teaching him um to do this kind of stuff and Duncan Cameron is one of the Montauk boys in case um in case you don't remember he is excuse me a second he is one of the one sec Duncan Cameron is one of the Montauk boys. So um, Alexander has been trained by um, Duncan Cameron to uh, do the um, astral travel and to take me. So that was quite interesting. I went on some trips with him. <coughs> um, oh, my God. Did I swear? Somebody's um, So Patrick, did I swear I didn't know that I did? Patrick? On mute. I'm sorry. It, it's all right. I just remind people of. Sometimes uh, we just do it without thinking, especially, you know, over in uh, Britain or Ireland. <laughs> it's part of the vocabulary there. So It is. Yeah. Don't you Americans swear? We do, but it's the FCC. It's no biggie. Just... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even know I, I swore. I didn't even know. Don't even. But never mind. Okay. Anyway, back to, I think we're just kind of coming to the um, last um, 10 minutes or so of the show. So um, thanks, Patrick, for producing. It's really kind of you. And um, you can reach me on Facebook, Christine John Hart. I'm on Facebook and I've got a YouTube channel. <coughs> it's under the same name, um, but 
I'm having trouble loading my show um, onto the um, YouTube. Perhaps someone will come forward and offer to download them. Mostly, uh, Miles Johnson is putting them on his channel. That's Miles Johnston. And um, mine are all under Basis 50. So you can find um, most of my shows there, probably including this one, even though it's just going to be um, an update show. And because I... I monologued last time and I didn't want to do it again because I don't think um, it's fair on the listener. I like to have guests on, um, but I was just doing an update explaining what guests I've got to come. So hopefully it wasn't too boring and hopefully you've learned something. Um, hopefully I will have um, the the DS, the, the ex-cop from the Hampstead case, coming on the show to talk about what he believes Um I've got Eric Keating, E.A. Keating, that's K-E-O-T-T-I-N-G, coming on. You can Google him and some of his stuff. And Joseph Farrell, who's written the books on the Nazi bell. And one of them is called God's Giants, I think Fallen Angels. And gosh, I can't remember, but I have ordered it and it's on its way. It's taking its time because it's coming from the States. So he's coming on too. And I haven't really got anybody else lined up after that. So um, I'm going to be looking around to see see who I want to come on and what direction I'll take the show in. I am probably going to not have a show at some point, perhaps after the summer, because I have to I have to get working. I mean, there is the idea that I can... Um, I can do investigations work. I do have a website, um, www.annieheartintelligence.com. And I've used my middle name or half my middle name because it's better than Chris, because if it's Chris, then it could be a boy. So I just wanted to show um, that I was a woman. However, it doesn't seem to have picked up much investigations work, even though I'm a really good investigator. I've been doing it most of my life. Um, I work for XMI6 agencies. <clears throat> and I'm really good at what I do. I was invited to um, an interview, supposedly um, tomorrow, but um, there was supposedly a position going in this company, and I checked them out. They turn out to not be bona fide. They set up a fake website to get me to go along, and the address that they sent me was rented offices in Covent Garden so I checked them out and I eventually tracked down one or two of them and they were an offshoot of a bigger investigation company that were trying to um I think that they were trying to assist BBC Panorama who were doing um something on investigators that work for the Daily Mail they um seem to want the Daily Mail to take a fall and um of course hacked off Dr. Evan Harris um wants me to come part of the Levinson two and to give evidence against the Daily Mail. I probably shouldn't say all this, so I'd probably end up getting bumped off um by the Daily Mail. That's the rotten thing to say about the Daily Mail. But my very good friend Sean Hoare was um murdered when he was um whistleblowing on things the news of the world did. He was murdered, um, but they said that, oh, he just died, a bit like Diana. He, he just died. Um, he was 41. He didn't just die. And um, when I gave evidence, I gave evidence for Wheating. I was supposedly due to become a witness, but my ex-boyfriend, the news editor, um, Greg Miskey of the News of the World, he then pleaded guilty, so I wasn't needed. Um and all of them pleaded guilty. So there wasn't really, nothing really came out because, oh, everyone pleaded guilty. And then, okay, you do your six months. And then it was all over. The public really didn't get much for their millions. Um, but they're trying to have, um, trying to have Levison too. But after I gave my six hour statement to the Wheating cops, they said to me, oh, would you like to um, go in a witness protection program now? <coughs> and I'm like, what you're kidding it's just a goddamn newspaper sorry I said goddamn it's just a newspaper and they they I said oh hang on do you think Sean Hall was murdered and they just looked at me just kind of raised his eyebrows and looked at me as if to say yes he he was murdered so um that's what you're looking at when you come to um England jolly old 
England, um, you go high up in the moneyed strata, then you're looking at dark. You know, it is dark. I probably shouldn't say all this, actually. Probably completely end up getting more than my tyres slashed. Um, but there you are. You know, I'm kind of getting older. Um, at the end of the day, I've probably got about 20 good years left and before I get to retirement age. And so why shouldn't I do something like this? Why shouldn't I reveal what's going on? But then I have to think I've only got a little boy um, who I'm his sole provider. So I have to think of him. So I can't really say too much. I can't see too much about things I've seen when I worked in Fleet Street, things I've seen um, when I worked for these XMI6 companies still doing work for the government. I do keep it zipped. I know to keep it zipped. People think I talk a lot. I talk a lot about certain things, but I don't talk a lot about others. So I haven't got the biggest mouth in the world. I'm not stupid. I've got a son. He's my first priority. But things I feel I can talk about and I will be let talk about, then I do talk about them. So I'm not completely as retarded as I might come across as um, being. Um, anyway, so really, thank you for listening to my show. And it's being stream of consciousness style. So it's probably um, annoyed a few people. I know Miles told me, um, Cara St. Louis went, she rambles. Um, so she thinks I ramble. Actually, we're speaking together at the conference in August. So um, I'll try not to ramble on there. <laughs> but when it's a show, you kind of think um, it's okay to do an update rambling. Um, it's two hours. So if you don't do that, then you're going to sound a bit um, mechanical. And I'd rather feel as if I was sitting with people having a cup of tea rather than making it kind of stiffo. So, um, and also I don't really want to lecture at people. So um, yeah, there we go. Um, so we've got... Um, Five minutes to go. Um, my book is available on, on Amazon. So if you've been interested in any parts of my life, um, actually, do you know, I tried to check it was on um, the other day on Amazon and I couldn't find it. So I'm going to give you the title um, for it's the same book. So I wrote Alien Experiences and it is actually exactly the same as uh, my other book, How Nick Davies Hired Me to Spy on My Former Colleagues at the News of the World. So if you can't find alien experiences, look for how Nick Davies hired me to spy on my former colleagues at the News of the World. And that should be there. I think it will be there. They're the only books I've self-published. Um, I'm a Sunday Times bestselling author, believe it or not, because once I got the big advance and, and spent that and most of it went to the tax man, I haven't seen a penny, but um it's out there and it got into the Sunday Times charts. It went as high as number 15. And that is Searching for Daddy, published by Hodder and Stoughton in hardback and paperback. And then there's my other book, which features Kenneth Bianchi, which was published by Random House, um, In for the Kill by C.J. Hart. Um, that has got a kind of Silence of the Lambs cover on it. Um, I really like the cover. It's kind of pretty. So any time I get the chance to say, someone, oh, it's the cover of my book, I do. <laughs> because um it's so pretty i just think it's pretty and um my other books the other two i self-published them and what i'm going to do is to update it and then get a publisher for it but i've needed to collate um the information but you can buy it on amazon really cheaply now um, before I start editing and cutting it and before I give it to um, a publisher to publish if if they'll accept it it's going to be about um, my experience with the greys my experience um, with the programs and everything I've been talking to you about on the show but in detail so if you're interested I think you can read the first 80 pages for free so go there check it out if you want it then um, please do go ahead and buy it <laughs> and also if you want to contact me i'm on facebook under christine joan hart and if you want to donate to the show to keep me on air and my paypal account is warnernews at sky.com that's w-a-r-n-e-r-n-e-w-s at sky.com 
Um, I do do two days a week doing shows. I wouldn't mind doing seven days a week or five days a week, but I have to um, I have to support my little boy. I have to support the, um, pay my rent by myself. And so um, I would need an income. So if anybody wants to sponsor this show, it's fantastic. But otherwise, <clears throat> I'm going to try and bring some work in, um, investigations work. If anybody needs investigations work, doing somebody found or any kind of investigations, due diligence, I'm your person. Um, my website, Um, I've really enjoyed um, sharing things tonight. And anyone that's listening, God bless. Anyone in the chat room, thanks ever so much. And Patrick Onglish has been my producer tonight. And thank you, Patrick. Oh, you're very welcome, dear. Happy to do it anytime. Oh, good. What's the weather like there? Where are you in America? Where about? In uh, Bayou country. I'm in Cajun country down in South Louisiana. So it's wow, cool. really? I didn't know that. You've got crocodiles and stuff. We sure do. Yeah. Wow. And you've oh. got. Hang on, what else do I know about that? You've got really gorgeous fried chicken. Yeah, that's a southern thing, but we can do it. We got all kind of Cajun food. I had crawfish the other night. Good Lord. Oh, yeah. And what kind of things do you drink? Oh, me? Water. <laughs> no, not, not a lot. Uh, coffee. Uh, there, There's all kind of beer and whiskey and wine, but I, I don't indulge. Um, oh, don't you? Why not? I just don't like it. I don't like alcohol. I don't like it what it does. I'd rather be sober. My mind works better. I feel better. Excellent. I don't um I don't tend to drink much actually. The odd um Budweiser <laughs> is good enough. But I always thought you guys drank um Jim Beam and all that. Oh, um, that's a Kentucky whiskey. That that's more Oh, I've got that's, that wrong. Yeah, uh huh. No. Isn't Kentucky no, near you? No, no, Kentucky's a good 12-hour right. drive away from about two or three states away. I'm on the Gulf of Mexico, yeah. right next to Texas. Oh, excellent. I, I, I'm going to come over and stay with you. Okay. <laughs> that sounds gorgeous.